Good evening. I'm so glad you're here for the last week of God Created, Not X-Rated. And the title just simply states it as plain as we could make it. God Created Sex. It's not X-Rated. What makes it, makes it X-Rated is how we and when we live outside of His boundaries. So we started this series by looking at God's boundaries. That's why we have this fence up here. We, we use the illustration of like cows or sheep or animals in a pasture. That if you're inside the fence, there's safety. But outside the fence, there's danger. And we said God's given us boundaries in the Bible. He doesn't say no to sex. What he says is wait. And his boundaries are very clear that it's in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. And he says, wait. And within those boundaries, there is freedom. And then uh, last week, or, or then the next week, we talked about commitment. And how the basis of Christ being the center of our marriage and, and our relationship being committed to Him and committed to one another. And how important that is. And last week, Mike talked about intimacy. He did a great job just walking through that. So this week, I'm going to talk about passion, the three things. Now, one of the things we've been doing in this series is asking you to text us questions that we're, you know, we're trying to answer as many as we can from a biblical perspective. What does the Bible say? And a lot of the questions have to do with what are, what's inside the boundaries here and what's outside the boundaries. So take out your phone, text me, church online. Those of you who are joining us online, I'm so glad you're joining us. You can uh, just type it in the chat room if you, if you want, but I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. Is what? Okay. Whatever you want to ask about sex. There's, this is like uh, everything you want to ask about sex, but we're afraid to. And it comes to me anonymously, so I won't call you out. You, I won't know online or anything, okay? So uh, l just, just send us those questions. And then I'm going to show you at the end, too, how I try to answer these questions, kind of my system for that. Now, we have been saying for the last few weeks, commitment, let's read this together. Commitment, intimacy, and passion are all a part of God's purpose for sex. It starts with commitment. And then it goes to intimacy. Last week, Mike, great job. Intimacy, what does that look like? And, and how does that uh, even, men, if you missed that one, you got to go back. AliveChurch.com, we archive all of our talks. you got to catch that one. Men especially, it's important for you. It will help you with the passion part. So today we're going to talk about passion. Everybody say passion. It's all a part of God's purpose for sex. We worked off this, this, uh, this little model here of this triangle. It's based on commitment. It starts with a commitment to Christ. Now, I know some of you listening to me, some of you are joining us, you're saying, well, I'm not a follower of Christ. Will, will these things still work? Yeah, they'll add a lot of value to your relationship. But I want to tell you, they really are designed by Him and for His glory. And you need to make that decision to really live out the commitment of love that you have in marriage and relationship. Or if you're single and you're looking for someone uh, to get married to, I hope you know the Bible says don't get unequally, unequally yoked. In other words, it says don't marry somebody who's not a follower of Christ because you will be a house divided. And Jesus says a house divided against itself will not stand. So it's so important that that commitment is based on Christ, our commitment to Christ and to one another. Last week uh, we talked about intimacy. Mike did that again. Go back to the archives. So today I want to just dive in and end this series by looking at passion. Now I want to start with Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Let's go back to the beginning. Because often we feel ashamed when it comes to this. We, we feel shame because uh, our, our society, our culture lives outside these boundaries. And so even in the church world, the Christian world, we're, we're afraid to talk about this. I, I can't tell you, I, I even have pastor friends that are saying, I can't believe you guys do a series on this. And they're, they're, I, don't, I, don't, I can't believe you're talking about this. Well, the problem is if we don't talk about it, it just keeps, the, our culture just keeps it taking it further and further outside of God's boundaries. We've got to talk about it. In fact, I, I was thinking about today and I thought, if I talked about this until our culture got this right, this is all I would talk about every week. I mean, we're so far off base of what God wants. So we, we want to just kind of go back to the very beginning because this is not a shameful thing. This is a blessing from God. It, we see this in the garden. Now the man and his wife, this is Adam and Eve, we're both naked, read it with me, but they felt no, sh they felt no shame. Well, why is it there's so much shame connected with sexuality in our lives today? And we are all, this relates to all of us because we're created as sexual beings by God. Why is there shame? Well, along comes sin. And most of the pictures you see of Adam and Eve, they've covered themselves up 
because of shame. They felt no shame though before. Now, how does it relate to us in the New Testament? Well, in Christ, we are free. We are renewed. We're restored. Um, and we can go back to no shame. Now, we all started with no shame. I- I'm telling you when, you, were, when you were a baby, you felt no shame about your nakedness. I, I know I didn't. Uh, before we moved to the farm, I was actually about almost three years old before we moved out to the farm. We lived in this little village called Mechanicsburg. One day, my mom got a call from a neighbor, and she and I just talked about this story again because I wanted to make sure I had it right. And, and she said, the neighbor called and says, Joan, Jeff is standing at my door, knocking on the door, and he's stark naked. <laughs> Mom, Mom's described to me, she said, now the neighbor lived what would be nowadays about a city block away. And she said, you had gotten out. I was fully clothed when I went to the backyard to play. I had taken off all my clothes, climbed up over a fence. I was 18 months old, climbed up over a fence, went through some other neighbor's yard and got to her door and was knocking on the door. So, you know, I felt no shame about it. I still don't. I don't even remember it, you know. For those of you who are from the 60s and the 70s and you thought streaking was cool, you're looking at the guy who invented it right here. I felt no shame. My mom came up with a plan. She said, okay, hold him there. Keep him there. I'll bring some clothes. And, you know, we felt no shame. And, and then we, as we grow up, we feel shame about this because we're living in sin. We come into sin and we started in this knowledge of it. But with Christ on the cross, we get back to no shame. And when we live inside the boundaries that God has for us in our sexuality, we can live with, say it with me, no, no shame. In fact, I want to take this a little further. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, we're going to dig into this today. Just look at these verses. And I want you to really get this from this weekend. We, not only do we feel no shame, but from this, we have healthy relationships. We see that the biblical pattern for a Christian marriage is free and frequent sex. Everybody say this with me. Free and frequent. One more time. Some of you are like, I can't even say sex in church. Some of you are sitting at home and you can't even say the word sex, okay? Let's say it together. Free and frequent sex. Now, this is why this is so important for us. Because as you saw in our little triangle, this is one-third of our relationship. So when it, we, in any relationship, uh, when it comes between a man and a woman in marriage, this is one-third. It's so important. We build on ki- commitment and intimacy and then passion. And if, if that part, if one-third of your relationship isn't working, it's unhealthy. You're in trouble. Now, well, why do we know it's free and frequent? You see, part of the tension uh, that we have in relationships, and especially marriage, is that we are always on this continuum between selfishness and servanthood, whether it's in the bedroom or outside of the bedroom. And that's true of every relationship, selfishness and servanthood, but especially uh, when it comes to a marriage, this shows up a lot in the bedroom. Selfishness and servanthood. In fact, I know that even more so after some of the comments from Mike's teaching last week. Because many of you said, well, yeah, but he doesn't do this, or she doesn't do that, and I'm not going to be the first one. This is all about sowing and reaping. And if we want healthy relationships, this is vitally important for us. Because in marriage, God designed inside the boundaries of marriage, he designed sex to be free and frequent. Everybody say it with me one more time. Free and free. You guys got those two words? Free and free. I still see some of you here, and I know there's some at home. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't even say that. My kid's sitting next to me. But you brought your kids so that I could talk to him instead of you, right? <laughs> yeah, I know how that works. Now, let, let's look at what this looks like for men and women. And this is overall generalities, but it's for about 95% fits for men and women. For, for her, sex comes from a healthy relationship. Again, look back at last week, Mike's teaching. If you missed that on intimacy, you got to go back, guys, and get that. Because for her, sex typically comes from intimacy. Go back to livechurch.com. Those of you church online, you know how to use that. And watch that talk. For him, sex leads to a healthy relationship. That's why we want to talk about this passion part of our relationship. Because we want healthy relationships. And if one-third of our marriage is not healthy, those of you who are single, you're going, well, this didn't apply to me. Well, if you're wanting to get married, you need to know what's coming. 
you need to get prepared for this. And I've told you, if you're single and you're dating or you, you've met that person or as you do meet him, you need, to have, you need to talk about this. Now, God's boundaries would say, well, you don't have to practice sex before. That's outside of his boundaries. But you, you wait and, and see the power of that. And that goes back to the intimacy part because it's the two becoming one flesh. And as you talk about it, you need to understand how this is going to work in your relationship. For her, intimacy leads to, uh, uh, sex comes from a healthy relationship. For him, it leads to. In other words, let's change our, our illustration here just a little bit. You can see here, this is the triangle we've been working on. And I'm on the passion part. For man, it starts with passion and goes over here. And, and I told you this, ladies, a couple weeks ago. You know, the best time to talk to him about something really serious that you're, you're in your relationship or that you want, man, is that first 30 minutes after you've made love. I'm telling you, you got 30 minutes of a clear mind and woo, go for it. Get prepared. For her, it starts on this side, intimacy, and works toward passion. And again, this adds to that tension, that tension we have relationally of becoming one flesh and yet this continuum of selfish or servant because i know some of you right now you're sitting there saying well if he would just be more intimate with me then we'd be more passionate and your husband is probably saying well if he'd be a little she'd be a little more passionate i'd be a little more intimate and it just creates this mess remember we started out by saying in this series that the enemy john 10 10 the enemy came to kill steal and destroy but Jesus said, I came to give you a rich and satisfying life. And we said, that includes your sex life. God wants you to have a rich and satisfying sex life. So if, he can, if the enemy can keep you from understanding this and living this out, and both of you saying, well, she's got to go first or he's got to go first, and then you're just going separate ways, he's winning. He's killing, stealing, and destroying. And he's, he is like loving it. And that's where some of you are living right now. That's why this is so important for us. Now, here's what this looks like for those of you who are on the real mathematical side. These are the relational qu equations. For men, commitment plus intimacy equals passion. Read it with me. Commitment plus intimacy equals passion. For women, commitment, read it, commitment plus passion equals... Interesting, isn't it? How the, the enemy wants to work that against us so much. We gotta, now you're saying, well, how do we work this out? Go back to Mike again last week. He said the first thing is communication, communication, communication. Communication. you, you got to talk about it. That's key to intimacy. Now, let's talk about some ways that we can enjoy free and frequent sex, how God has given us, uh, how he wants us to enjoy this. How do we live this out? First thing, I'm going to give you just a few things this evening. Number one, don't use sex as a weapon. Everybody say it with me. Don't use sex as... We tend to do that. Marriages, we, 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 we tend to do that. In fact, Chris, if you're a Christian here and you're listening to my voice online, you would say, yeah, everything outside of God's boundaries is perversion. We've perverted sex in our culture. Well, this is one way that Christians pervert sex, and we would never say that we're outside of his boundaries. But when we take sex that God has given us in, between a man and woman and we use it as a weapon, we are no longer in the boundaries. We are outside the boundaries because God didn't design it to be a weapon. And some of you are going, well, how do you use it as a weapon? We would never do that. Uh, let me show you a couple of things. First of all, let's look at what the Bible says. The husband should fulfill, we're just going to live in 1 Corinthians 7 the rest of the, day, the evening, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. Now, most men listening to my voice are going, I'm all over it. Anytime she has a need, I am more than happy to oblige. I mean, that's the way most men feel, okay? And I know it's not, that's not 100% true. Uh, it's a, I'm giving you the generalization, and I know that. There are some men, it's, it's the other way around. But husbands, that's part of what you're supposed to do. And the wife should fulfill her husband's need. In other words, this is, a, this is a term that literally means we're to fulfill it. And the, the term, fu word fulfill in the original uh, Greek language means in a benevolent way and in a contractual way. Go, oh, wait a minute. That's kind of weird. Now, remember, when you get married, you're saying that to that other person, you are my only legitimate source for sexual fulfillment for the rest of my life. 
So literally, this word fulfill means to fulfill a debt, either benevolently or just because you chose to do this. And, and if you're single and you're saying, I don't want to live like that, well, that's why I'm telling you to read 1 Corinthians 7, because Paul says, hey, if you're single and you're not ready for this, it's okay, stay single the rest of your life if you can live that way. And he, he goes on to tell you, you can focus more on God's kingdom. But if you're like most of us, he says, you, you, because of self, lack of self-control, he says, get married. And in marriage, within the boundaries, we are to fulfill, either benevolently or because of, this is a debt, this is what we've said we would do when we said, I'm getting married. And you say, well, I just want to have sex without marriage. Well, you're outside the boundaries. And there's a price that comes with that. And I, and I hope that you've gotten that. If you haven't, I mean, go back to the last three weeks and listen to this whole series because there's a price to sin. I've had people ask me, and even in this series, they say, yeah, but I'm living in sin sexually, but can't I be forgiven? I go, yeah, but let's talk about the consequences. And they go, oh, what consequences? And boy, when we walk through that, because Jesus talks about how this is the two becoming one flesh, not just in marriage, but in sexuality, we become one flesh. I know some of you have blown it already, and this may be the first time you're hearing that, and you're going, well, what do I do? Well, we do have forgiveness and grace. But if you're, you're sitting here thinking, well, I can live outside the boundaries and get forgiven, you need to know there's always a consequence to sin. So we, part of this free and frequent sex is we are bound to do this in marriage. That's part of what we're agreeing to in marriage. He goes on, he says, let's read it together. The wife gives authority over her body. See, I, that's funny. We got right to it, and all of, suddenly all the ladies are going, I've never seen that verse before. I'm not reading that out loud. You know, a couple years ago, I did a teaching. Uh, one of our core values here is biblical authority. And I got out the Bible, and I said, you know what? There are some verses that we, we just all would say, well, I don't really agree with that verse. And I got my scissors out, and I started cutting out verses out of the Bible. You could have heard a pin drop in here. Everybody's like, oh, how could you cut the Bible? And, and I said, What's the difference between me cutting it out of a piece of paper and us cutting it out of our lives and saying, yeah, I'm going to live the Bible except for that part. This is what Scripture says. This is God's boundaries. He says, the wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And the husband, and again, I know husbands are all in. Yeah, baby, it's all yours. <laughs> the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. In other words, we're saying when, in, in the context of of this selfish versus uh, being a, a servant, we're saying we become one flesh. And I want you to see the beauty of this. The beauty of it is it's a gift from God, and God says you become one with somebody else. And culture would say, no, 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 no. Your body's your body. And, and God says, no, two become one. And it is such a beautiful, powerful thing. And if you're single, you need to see that. That's why you wait. Because that is the ultimate of intimacy, is the two becoming one flesh. Now, some of you, your parents, and you, you, you blew it, and you're like, well, I can't tell my kids to wait. I didn't wait. Are you kidding me? Don't you want your kids to do better in life than you're doing? Help them learn from your mistakes. Talk to them about the consequences you've, you've experienced, the hurt, the pain. Let them do better. At, I, I want the next generation to be better than us. Don't you, at living for God? So we give authority over. Now, how do we use this as a weapon? See, we, we use it as a weapon if we go against those two verses. She says things like this. She'll say things like, you have to earn it. Now, after what, last week, with Mike's great talk on intimacy, some of you ladies, you're feeling like, well, when he starts talking to me and we start communicating better, then, then, then he'll earn this. But you see, that's outside of God's boundaries. If you're making him earn it. We men, here's what we say, and this is based on a study. There are studies that show that men, uh, testosterone, as it builds up in your body, it makes you moody, frustrated, and mean. Now, right now, some men are going, I knew it. It is her fault. <laughs> you see, now, when you go to her and you say, oh, my goodness, it's your fault. The reason I'm mean to you and mad, you're using it as a weapon. Well, how do you deal with this tension because you're both so very different? Go back to last week's, we, we did the, gave the, the tool, the withholds tool. You need to be going out on dates and saying, okay, let's do this. Let's communicate. Let's do the withholds. Um, you know, when you did this, that hurt because of this. Or, and, you, and you talk about this. You keep communicating about it. So don't use sex as a weapon. 
it cannot be used as a weapon. And some of you, I, I know right now you're justifying it inside. You're going, oh, you don't know him or you don't know her. I'm telling you, you got to go back to what the Bible says. You become one flesh. We give authority over. We're to fulfill. That's part of God's blessing. And inside of that, it's sowing and reaping, and God will bless us. Second uh, key to enjoying free and frequent sex is uh, initiate sex frequently. Everybody say that with me. Initiate sex frequently. Now, right away, somebody goes, well, who? Who should initiate? Both of you. Both of you should. Because this is a one-third of your relationship, this passion, uh, intimacy, and commitment. So you both should be in initiating it. Now, the next question is, well, what does frequently mean? <laughs> and the guys right now are hoping I'm saying twice a day, and the ladies are hoping for twice a year, maybe. I don't know. In some relationships. You know, fr frequently, it, it, it definitely, again, goes back to you communicating. Uh, it's so important in your relationship. What, is it, what does it look like for you? There may be times there are limitations. Um, but you need to really be on the same page with this. One of you may have a greater need than the other. Uh, Martin Luther, from the 1500s, uh, part of the Reformation, great theologian, he was asked this question. He said, how often should a Christian couple have sex? And his answer was this, twice a week, 104 times a year. That was in the 1500s. Now, the average couple does, in America, have sex, average married couple, uh, twice a week. Um, and, and this is good to know if you're here and you're thinking about becoming a Christian, but statistics show that those who have more sex and are more fulfilled in their sex are followers of Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, I, I read that, and I'm like, well, that is so, such a no-brainer, because when you're living in the designs, the one who designed this, and you're living in his boundaries, it, it works better. Otherwise, it becomes damaging and frustrating outside of the boundaries. So what's frequent for you? Well, we, we know the studies show that the younger you are, it's a little more frequent, uh, and it does slow, slow down with age. But you've got to determine that. Uh, and and we, we just know that. <laughs> Some of you right now, you're, you're looking around the room going, boy, if I wish I were 20 years younger, then it'd be more frequent. Others are going, to, uh, you know, it's all, it's all relevant. Okay? But uh, in, initiate sex frequently. Here's what, here's what Paul says. He says, do not what? Do not deprive. The word here means don't default on this. Don't deprive each other of sexual relations. Now, read that whole line with me. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. He's talking to married couples right here. And if you're single and you're like, I'm not sure about sex for me, well, you, you might want to cons consider just staying single. If you, don't, you think that's, I don't want that to be a part of my life. Because in, in this union, this oneness, God says, don't deprive each other of sexual relationships. Now, he does give an exception, and this isn't the only exception. There may be physical limitations. I mean, if, if he's sick and throwing up and she's saying, I want sex, it's probably not the right thing. <laughs> you know, that's that continuum of selfishness or servanthood. You know, at that point, you need to be a servant and say, how can I help you with your sickness? But he gives another one. He says, Unless, don't deprive each other, unless both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, or we say limited time, so that you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Now, some of you ladies going right now, you're going, oh, I got a new excuse. <laughs> ladies, most of you don't pray that much, okay? <laughs> and I hope you didn't give it up for Lent. He says, but then he goes on and he says something else. He says, afterward, you should come back together again, talking about sex, so that Satan won't be able to what? He, he says, don't deprive one another. If you deprive one another, you are opening yourself and your mate up to tem temptation. You are to come back together. In other words, you are to come back together and take care of business. It becomes business time. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, that's right, baby. Girl, tonight we're gonna make love. You know how I know, baby, cause it's Wednesday. <laughs> and Wednesday night is the night that we make love. 
Tuesday night's the night that we go and visit your mother, but Wednesday night is the night that we make love. Because everything is just right. Conditions are perfect. There's nothing good on TV. Conditions are perfect. You lean in close and say something sexy like, I might go to bed, I've got work in the morning. I know what you're trying to say, baby. You're trying to say, oh yeah, it's business time. It's business time. It's business. It's business time. That's what you're trying to say. You're trying to say, let's get down to business. It's business time. It's business. Next thing you know, we're in the bathroom, brushing our teeth. That's all part of it, that's foreplay. <laughs> then you go sort out the recycling, that's not part of it, but it's still very important. <laughs> then, we're in the bedroom. You're wearing that ugly old baggy t-shirt from that team building exercise you did for your old work. <laughs> and it's never looked bad on you. An exercise 99. Oh, you don't know what you're doing to me. I remove my jeans, but trip over them because I still got my shoes on. But then I turn it into a sexy dance. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm down to just my socks. And you know when I'm down to just my socks, what time it is. It's time for business. It's business time. It's business, that's why they call business socks. It's business, it's business time. Ooh. Ooh. Making love, making love for two, making love for two minutes. When it's with me, you only need two minutes, because I'm so intense. Two minutes in heaven is better than one minute in heaven. You say something like, is that it? I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> then you tell me you want some more. Well, I'm not surprised. But I'm quite sleepy. It's business, it's business time. Business hours are over. Baby, it's business, it's business time. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you guys laughed. <laughs> it's business time. Paul tells us in Corinthians, he said, do not deprive one another. Isn't it amazing that that is a command that we look at and we break that command so many times. In fact, there are some things that we, the modern day church, try to make commands that aren't even in the Bible. And yet, when we don't keep that command, we think there should be no consequences. I'm always amazed that, you know, the Bible's very clear and most of us would say, there are consequences to adultery. And my question is, well, what are the consequences for the spouse who does not keep that command? The Puritans, so many years ago, thought so strongly of this command. The Puritans, that they said, uh, they literally kicked a guy out of the community because he would not make love to his wife. They said, you're not keeping the Bible. And they discommunicated him. Isn't that amazing? And for some of us in our marriage, we're still back at using it as a weapon. And, and, and God says, no, don't, don't be proud. Initiate this. Make it part. This is what makes you one. And singles, don't miss that. That's why it's worth waiting for. Because God has given you such an incredible gift with this one person the rest of your life. And you don't want to waste it. And if you have, God forgives. And we go on and 
You can grow, but you're going to deal with those consequences. This is a good thing. So let me give you the third thing, the third key to enjoying free and frequent sex. Everybody say it with me one more time. Free and fr- Come on, like, like you're comfortable with it now. Free and frequent sex. Enjoy sex with freedom. Now, I, I want to read a few verses. I'm going to go out of 1 Corinthians now to the Song of Solomon. Some of your Bibles say the Song of Psalms. Uh, the difference is just that some theologians, as they are translating it, think that uh, they're not real convinced that Sol- Solomon wrote them. Some are. I personally think, just from reading his other writings, that, that Solomon did write this. So I, uh, NLT talk, calls it the Song of Solomon. So we're going to look at this. And for you who are married this week, this is going to be part of your challenge. Uh, singles, I have a different challenge for you going back to 1 Corinthians. But I want you to see that within the boundaries, there's freedom. And I am not the one who tells you what freedom you can have or what limitations you can have. It's between the two of you, as long as they're within God's boundaries. So in the Song of Solomon, she, the wife, is getting ready to do a dance. It's called the Dance of Mahanam. And in, as she does this dance, it's really what we would call, and it's unfortunate because the Song of Solomon, it's translated in the English language. The translators are always afraid to translate how it really reads. It was such a strong uh, language in the original text that kids were not allowed to read this part of the Bible until they came of age and were ready to get married because it was that powerful. So I, I'm going to challenge you to read it this week as a married couple, and you're going to read some things. You're going, you think that means, and probably whatever you think it means, that's what it means. <laughs> I'm telling you. If, and if I even read it the way it was in the original language up here, you guys would say, I can't believe you said that stuff in church. So I won't even do that, okay? But I, I'll insinuate enough so you can get there. So she's dancing for him. It's basically... She's doing a strip tease dance. And you're saying, Jeff, I have to do a strip tease dance? I got to learn how to do that? That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, although if you, you trip on your business socks, you might, you know, guys. <laughs> but what I'm saying is within these boundaries, it's the freedom between the two of you, okay? Within God's boundaries, there's freedom. Some of you'd say, I'm so uncomfortable, that'll never happen. Well, you guys communicate about it. That's part of keeping the marriage bed pure. Uh, he is describing her, talking to her as she's dancing. Now, I find this really interesting, but if you'll go back, I'm, I'm looking at it from the man's perspective, but the Song of Solomon looks at it from both perspectives. When she describes him, she starts at the head and works her way down. When he describes her, he starts at her feet and works his way up. And I, I, I think there's really something to that, that that's more typical of men and women. He says, how beautiful are your sandaled feet? Not fee. I don't know how that... <laughs> I remember, it's free and frequent. There's no fee, okay? <laughs> of all the mistakes that we've made this week. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so, uh, and, and feet were considered very sensuous in, in that day because uh, they wore sandals everywhere. Uh, he says, your rounded thighs are like jewels. Remember, this is in the context of marriage. He's looking at his wife, and he's looking at her thighs. And he says, they're, they're the work of a skilled craftsman. Literally, he says, man, they're like a masterpiece. He looks at her thighs, and he goes, man, it's like a masterpiece. And some of you ladies are like, oh, I'd be so uncomfortable if my husband was just looking at me. And like, Look, you got to get to this place where you're comfortable. You're one flesh. And if you're so uncomfortable with this, you've got to get back to that place of no shame. Let God work on that. So he's looking at her thighs. Now, this is really a very, very unfortunate uh, uh, translation. He goes on to say, your navel is perfectly formed like a goblet filled with mixed wine. Uh, almost every theologian will tell you that they just did not want to write the word here. Um, because the word is actually the most intimate sexual part of a woman. And, and, and guys, you could relate to this. If you're looking at your wife and you're working your way up and you see her thighs, you do not skip over and go to the belly button. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you're going to stop and linger for a while. And that's literally what it fa- says. In fact, just recently, uh, the head of Southern Baptist Convention, he was looking at this verse and he says, it is so unfortunate because... Uh, that word literally means what I'm insinuating it means. He says, form like a goblet, filled with mixed wine. Mixed wine. And what he's saying here, I want to partake. I, I, I want to be involved. I want to partake like drinking wine. He says, between your thighs lies a mound of wheat uh, bordered with lilies. And some of you are going, man, is he talking about what I'm thinking? He, yeah, <laughs> he was. Now, why, why would you say this in church, Jeff? Because listen to me, church. 
there's freedom within this context. And, and we, we, because the world has perverted sex and taken it outside of God's boundaries, we're saying, well, every little thing, do I have to get permission? Or what? And it's no, it's between the two of you becoming one flesh. There's freedom. Now, he goes on, and, and I'll end here. Um, he says, your breasts are like two fawns. So you can see he's working his way up. They're like twin fawns of a gazelle. The reason this, these words are important is that was representative in their culture of playfulness. It's like, man, they're just so beautiful and playful. And he, when he says this, oh, how beautiful you are, he's saying, I am so pleased with you sexually. Man, imagine that in this tension of our relationship between servant or selfishness, that we become so one that we're willing to serve one another so completely. Not only being committed to one another, Christ and each other, but to serve one another in intimacy and ultimately in passion. Imagine how that your, your marriage would change, how you would live different. Imagine how that would change temptation for your spouse, for you, because you realize that, wow, sex is this incredible gift of God inside his boundaries, and I am no longer going to let the world dictate with his perversions. I'm going to live within his boundaries. And in that, I'm going to have freedom. Inside of marriage, the biblical context for sex is free and frequent sex. It's part of having a healthy relationship. Now, some of you right now are going, well, guess we're not healthy. And I would say to you, yeah, if that's a problem for you, it may be a problem that you're not healthy. In fact, I read studies in the last couple of weeks 20% of the marriages in the United States are sexless marriages. In other words, they have sex once every six months to a year. Now, that makes that average of two a week, you guys are really messing it up for the rest of us. So you're, you're taking the average way down. But you'd say, well, we, we, we're, we're fine without it. And I'm telling you, God would say, no, you're not. There's a problem because it's part of a healthy relationship. It may not be twice a week, but to have a sexless marriage, God says, don't deprive one another. It's in the boundaries. It's part of us becoming one flesh. That's what he has for us. Now, I asked you to send me some questions, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm hoping you gave Mike all the hard questions last week, and I have none. Okay, somebody says this. Is it okay to fake it? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. I mean, I'm pretty sure... Here's what I would say. Why would you want to? I don't get that. Um, you know, work it out. If two people are engaged to be married and are waiting for their marriage date, is sex okay? God's boundaries are the context of marriage. It's based on commitment. So wait, the commitment is marriage. In fact, I have couples all the time that come, and they'll show me the ring, you know, and we got engaged. And I'll say, when's the date? And they'll say, well, we haven't set a date. And I'll say, then you're not engaged. And you, you just the guy's like, oh, no. I'm like, dude, you haven't even set a date. You haven't made a commitment. Ladies, if you're moving in with him and you think sex is going to make him committed, you need to understand he's so uncommitted to you that he won't marry you. But if you'll give him sex, you think it's going to work. It doesn't work. Only 50% of couples living together end up getting married. And of those 50% that get married, only three or 30% survive. That's a 70% failure rate because it needs to be based on commitment. Now, let me end with this. Let me give you this. How do you, there, I know a lot of you have questions like, is this okay? What can we do or use or whatever in, in the bedroom? Here's the questions I ask. I ask, is it lawful? And what I mean by that, is it lawful both biblically? Does the Bible say anything about it? There are a lot of things that in our culture, the, the Bible was silent about because they didn't have it in that, that culture. What's the Bible say about it? And is it lawful as far as is it legal? I mean, that's part of the answer. The second thing is, is it helpful to our marriage? Does it help in our relationship? And the third, is it enslaving? Because there are some things that people say, well, that's really helping us right now. But is, is it enslaving? Is it something you're going to become addicted to? Is that something that you're going to prefer over your mate? Then don't do that. That's how you answer that question. You go back to, what does the Bible say? What's the law say? What is God's law and the, the law of the land say? Is it helpful? Is it enslaving? The issue is not what is done. This is what I want you to get the, in the bedroom. 
But the issue is with whom it's done. In fact, did you know, in the Song of Solomon and in Proverbs, they're, they're, those are two very different stories. The woman, in, in both cases, says the exact same, same, same things, does the same dance, uh, wears the same stuff, acts the same way. The difference between one being the adulteress and the other one being celebrated in the Song of Solomon, it's the relationship. It's the context of marriage. So here's my challenge to you this week. Uh, this is about keeping the marriage bed pure. What's it mean to be pure? That means it's between you two. Keep it pure. Take out your connection card, and if you would, here's my challenge. My next step this week, if you're married, read the Song of Solomon and 1 Corinthians 7 together this week. And as you're going through it and you, you, you're going to be talking, I want you to read it out loud together before you go to bed. As you're reading the Song of Solomon and you're going to say, you think it means that? It's, yeah, I'm telling you it means that, okay? Uh, it's amazing how explicit it is. If you're single, my challenge to you is go back and read 1 Corinthians 7 this week and celebrate where you are in life. And if you desire to get married, man, begin praying for that right mate to come along, somebody who wants to live in God's plan. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, as we come to the end of this talk, I pray you speak to our hearts. The end of this series, Lord, is so important in our lives. We want to celebrate the blessings you've given us. We want to live within your boundaries. We know it all starts with a commitment to you. Lord, for those who are married, that they would say, we're not living in these boundaries. Help them to make that commitment to say, God, I am going to. I understand that I am the only legitimate fulfillment for my mate. I'm making a commitment to live out my marriage vows. Help both couples, both people in the, as a couple, Lord, to, to make that commitment right now. And if you've never made a commitment to Christ, I'm going to tell you that's where it starts that your marriage is built on that foundation. Just pray this prayer to begin that relationship. Give your life to him for all eternity. Just say, Lord, I'm inviting you into my life. I'm tired of living in shame. Forgive me of my sin. Let this day be a day of new beginning. And let me be the person and live the purpose you have for my life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back here to Church Online. I'm Justin. I'm the Alive Church Online Pastor. And I want to say thank you for joining us for the last week of God Created and Not X-Rated. If you have any prayer requests or anything that you would like us to know about, uh, please do fill out your connection card. The connection card link is underneath the chat window right now. Or if you go to AliveChurch.com, there's actually a tab there you can click on. You can let us know any of the information, put in a prayer request. Our elders here at Alive pray for those every week. So if there's anything we can help you with in prayer, please do let us know. We have life groups going on right now. It's not too late to join if you're in the local Tucson area or we do an online uh, life group as well. If you would like information about either of those life groups, do fill out your connection card and put in the comment section that you're, you're interested in a life group and we'll get information out to you. Also, if you've missed any of the other previous messages for this series or any series we've done in the past, go to livechurch.com and click on the recorded services section there you can view any of our recorded services in the past at any time at your convenience. Also, if you're interested in doing the Lent reading plan with us, uh, put, fill out your connection card and put in the comment section that you want information about the Lent reading plan. We'll get that to you. Also, if you're interested in the marital resource guide that we've been referencing throughout this whole series, put that in your comments section as well and we'll get information out to you. In a moment, we're going to watch a video about inviting friends to church and then we'll come back afterwards.